today's guest played safety and on special teams in the National Football League. However, his playing career was so brief that he was able to become the NFL's youngest assistant coach and defensive coordinator ever. He later became the fourth African-American head coach with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers and the first African-American head coach to win a Super Bowl with Indianapolis in 2007. Today, he's a heralded analyst with NBC and a best-selling author along with his wife as success has followed him everywhere even here. I welcome Hall of Famer today, Tony Dungy. Let's greet Tony Dungy. Good to have you, buddy. Now, Tony, to think how things started and the arduous trek to get there, that you would wind up here in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Really, really hard to believe. Um, I started out at the University of Minnesota. I played quarterback my whole life, elementary school, junior high, high school, college. Didn't get drafted, and I was crushed at the time. Gosh, what's going to happen? Ended up being the best thing for me. I went to Pittsburgh, switched positions, switched sides of the ball, went to the defensive side, played for Chuck Knoll, uh, and learned professional football from Coach Knoll, learned the other side of the ball. After two years, I got traded to the San Francisco 49ers. I played for another Hall of Fame coach in Bill Walsh, saw a different system, and then at 25 years old, I was out of the league. Coach Noel called me back and said, I, I think you'd be a, a perfect fit for our staff. Coach Noel called, called you? Called me. And uh, amazingly, I got an intro into coaching at 25 years old, and I'm coaching uh, at the best place in football. Let's also parallel that with what your family life was like and the kind of influence that mom and dad provided. Yeah, I was really, really blessed. Uh, my mother was a, a teacher. My dad was a teacher as well. And they always kind of drilled in us to think about the future, think about your life, what do you want to do? But uh, my mom especially was uh, look at, at life and know that God's leading you. Try to figure out whether things are going well or whether you're disappointed. What's the next step? And that, that really, I think, shaped me, and it came from my parents. And some assets, if you will, that they possessed that spoke to why, from my perspective, you were so successful in coaching uh, and what you're doing even now. They were teachers? They were teachers. And I, I can remember uh, sitting up recording my mom's grade book for her. And she would say, oh, Johnny Smith, he's got a C plus. He's a better student than that. I, I've got to do something to get him going. And my dad was the same way. His saying was his job as a teacher was to help every student get an A. That's what he thought his job was. And so when I got into coaching, I kind of took that same perspective. My job is to help the players be the best that they can be. And if somebody's not playing well, what can I do to help them? Hopefully this makes sense as well, Coach. Your dad and the disappointments that he had along the way, given the amount of talent that he had, I'm supposing that had an influence on you in terms of how you dealt with difficulties, but how you channeled it based on what you saw in your dad. Yeah, my dad was a special man, a PhD in physiology uh, at a time when that wasn't the norm for African Americans. Um, he always talked to me about handling disappointments by looking at what can you do to make the situation better. And uh, I remember him telling me, he said, you know, there was a time they didn't want to let us fly planes and we had to teach ourselves. So just make the situation better. And I scratched my head for a long time. What does he mean by that? Found out at his funeral that he was in the Tuskegee Airmen. And Hold that, on, you found out at your own dad's funeral? You know, he never really talked about it, uh, never said, you know, hey, this was a special group and all the accolades that they got. But he just said, that was a situation that was tough. We didn't cry about it. We tried to find a way to make the situation better. And that's what he always passed on to us. Tony Dungy, as even killed as you are, as calm as you are, you're going to sit here and tell me or have told me over the days that you had a temper, <laughs> that you could lose your temper really easily? Yeah, I was ultra competitive and hot-headed. Uh, technical... Tony Dungy, <laughs> hot-headed. <laughs> technical fouls, kicked out of games. Oh, yeah, yeah. It took a long while, and I did eventually learn that lesson that being under control is better than being um, emotional. 
You know, my wife uses you as an example a lot of times <laughs> of things I need to improve on. We'll talk about that more with Coach Tony Dungy coming up after this. <laughs> Coach Tony Dungy's philosophies include whatever it takes, no excuses, no explanations. He's also said my philosophy was to convince every guy on the team that his role was important. I wish I could take credit for it, but that was uh, my coach, Chuck Knoll, speaking to me as a young player. And I said, boy, I want to transfer that over to the players that play for me. It, it was so special and so important to me. And Coach Knoll also said something that really kind of cemented my coaching philosophy. He said, I, I'm not here to motivate players because he didn't believe you won with emotion. He believed you won with execution. And uh, I carry that over. And that, that's what I tried to get across to our teams. And I may not know all of the people who poured into you, Coach, but let me throw a couple names out and have you speak on what they poured into you. Denny Green, God bless him. Coach Green really formulated me as a head coach. He'd call me in and tell me why he was doing things. He prepped me for interviews. He wanted to see me succeed. Ownership in Kansas City. Lamar Hunt. I, I was there three years. The Hunt family, you're talking about special people, uh, treating everyone as family. And I saw that in Art Rooney Sr. and Dan Rooney with the Steelers. Uh, again, those kind of things impact you when you see not only can you win doing it that way, but it helps you win when everybody's together. So you had all of these folks pouring into you, Coach, in a preparation phase. But it seemed to those of us on the outside, it took an eternity <laughs> for you to get the opportunity to be a head coach. How did you view it when you got the opportunity? How did you maximize on it? It did take a while. I would go to these interviews and think I'm going to get the job and come in second and, and come back and say, oh, man, I didn't get it. I didn't really get over anxious and I, I just had to trust the Lord that the right time and the right job would come and, and it did come at Tampa Bay. I think it's very important to know there was one job you thought was yours until ownership or somebody in leadership said something to you that kept you from getting the job. I was in this interview and it was going along really well. We took a break and I remember calling my wife Lauren and saying I, I think this might be the one. Boy, we just seemed to be clicking. And at the end of the interview, um, the owner actually asked me, he said, now I've read something about you. I heard you don't use profanity. I heard you rarely raise your voice. And I said, well, I, I try not to. And he said, how in the world are you going to get these players to respond then? How are you going to keep people in line? Because how are you, you would not engage in profanity laced tirades to encourage somebody. That was not my style. And he said, how do you do it? And I said, well, kind of like my dad did it. I show the players that I love them, I care about them, I show them I know what I'm doing. NFL then, players, I love you. <laughs> and I care about you, okay. and I respect you, and that in turn will generate that same type of mutual respect, and because of that, these guys will perform. And the owner looked at me and he said, I don't think that'll work in the National Football League. And I didn't get the job. The next year I in interviewed in Tampa, uh, with the Glazer family and Rich McKay, the GM, and I got the job. And I, I remember the first meeting with the players. I said, this is how I'm going to coach you. I let you know I'm a Christian, first and foremost. So I'm not going to curse at you. I'm not going to yell at you. I'm not going to demean you. I said, there are people that think that's the only way you guys will learn and function. You said that to I them. said that in the first meeting. I said, now let me know if there's anybody who needs that, raise your hand. And you know no one raised their hand. <laughs> so I said, if you need it, we can trade you to another team where they'll yell at you and scream. But here's the way we're going to do it. <laughs> Nobody wanted to go. And uh, that, was, that was that. He's a Super Bowl winning coach. He's in the <laughs> Hall of Fame. It obviously worked. More with Coach Tony Dungy after this.
their seven years together, Indianapolis won five divisional titles and a Super Bowl. Where did your Super Bowl winning team rank talent-wise in winning the Super Bowl? Wow, you know, I was in Indianapolis seven years and uh, had some great teams, but that Super Bowl team was probably number five uh, of that seven in terms of raw really? talent. It was, but it was the team that came together uh, the most. They stuck together. They had that cohesion that uh, they wouldn't be defeated. Talk about how you prepared your team the night before the Super Bowl with a game plan speech. Yes, we were talking about the Super Bowl year, and we had some ups and downs. And I, I remember telling the team, uh, this is not going to be a smooth ride tomorrow. There's going to be some storms, but we've navigated it all year. We'll get through it. we just got to stick together as we have. And uh, I made a decision that night. If we lost the toss, we were going to kick off and kick it to Devin Hester so we could show Hold tight. You were going to kick the ball directly at <laughs> Devin Hester. We were going to the show The most dangerous return man in the game. That we meant business and we weren't afraid. Twelve seconds later, he was in the <laughs> other end zone. Twelve and seconds I later. I feel my players saying, yeah, you said there was going to be a storm, but you didn't say you were going to create it. <laughs> <laughs> so I felt badly, but we, just as we'd done all year, we rallied, we uh, came back together and, you know, won that ball game. Uh, and it was just typical of, of that team. They would not let anything get them down. They wouldn't stay down. And they rallied back and won that ball game. And Tony, I go back to when you turn that franchise, you and your coaching staff and the players helped to turn that Tampa Bay franchise around. You thought you were going to be there for the rest of your career, that this was the job. Yet you got fired, even though you guys enjoyed postseason success. I have never in all of my career covering the NFL see a head coach go to the press conference announcing his firing. Why? Well, I was in Tampa six years, and uh, we went to the playoffs four times, and uh, you know, had some wonderful, wonderful memories. Uh, the ownership made a decision to go in a different direction after year six. I wanted to go in there and thank them for the opportunity they gave me to be a head coach because no one else had, had done that for me. And so I wanted to get that across. So I went to the press conference. I thanked the Glazers. And I still have a great relationship with them today. Uh, God had something different in store, new team, new players, uh, new fans, uh, new friends that I made, uh, and it was, you know, it was a disappointment, but it was an opportunity. And you got the phone call how much after <laughs> your firing to come to Indianapolis? It was probably four or five days later. I came home. There was a message on, on my voicemail. It was Jim Ursay, the owner of the, the Colts, and he said, I, we made a change at our head coaching position. You're the man I want. He said, I shouldn't say this, but it doesn't even matter. Tell me how much money you want. I want you, we want to build our team a certain way, and we think you're the man to do it. And how many of us would like to go to a job and say, you know, it doesn't make any difference how much? Go I ahead. I called him back, and after talking to him, I knew that's where I wanted to go. And we will come back with more of Coach Tony Dungy after this. Tony Dudge said his quarterback Peyton Manning was the hardest working guy who had great ability. Peyton has rare talent but chooses to push himself like he doesn't. Fair or unfair, the moniker that Peyton had to wear for a while was a great quarterback who couldn't win the big one. Talk about that championship push. Well, that was definitely an unfair moniker. Uh, Peyton Manning, one of the most special people that I've ever been around. He was a tremendous leader for us and that team would not have been where it was without his leadership. He worked uh, harder than any player I've ever been around. He pushed everyone else, but he exemplified the things that as a coach you wanted to get across. So it was great for me because I didn't have to always talk about it. Were you okay in having a guy who at least the press said, oh, you know what, he's pretty much running the show himself, not understanding the dynamic there. Were you okay with that, Tony? Peyton did a lot for that offensive football team, but he did not run the show himself. He was one of the most, how would I put it, uh, team-oriented people and game plan oriented people. He was great at orchestrating. And again, a, speaking of orchestration, a good team oriented approach. You mentioned Tom Moore for the uninitiated. 
Who was Tom Moore and what role did he play in your career? Why you had him on the team? Tom Moore was our offensive coordinator with the Colts. He was there before I got there. Uh, put in this no huddle offense for Peyton and it was a fantastic just mix, perfect storm. Coaching is certainly all about knowing the attitude, character of your players. Talk about an experience that you had with Warren Sapp that also taught you a lesson. I was Warren young, Sapp, of course, the Hall of Famer from Tampa Bay. Yes, young coach. Our second year in Tampa, we're starting to play well, starting to win. We were on a, riding a winning streak, and Warren got hurt. He broke a bone in his hand. So I came and said, Warren's hurt. He's not going to be able to play. We can't cry about it. What are we going to do to make the situation better? Tioka Jackson, you're playing. We're going to rally behind you, and let's go. We beat the Miami Dolphins that night, but the next day Warren came <laughs> into my office and said, you didn't even miss me. You don't need me. <laughs> you made me feel like I wasn't valuable. And I learned. I said, boy, the lesson I was trying to teach the team, that was one thing, but I forgot about the individual. And you can't ever do that. In terms of the game of life, you are a best-selling author. You've written a number of books, a couple with your wife as well, too. Quiet strength certainly does define who you are in the minds of most people. What led you to become a writer, an author? Actually, Nathan Whitaker, who co-wrote that book with me, uh, we worked together with the Bucks, and he, for years, you ought to tell your story, you ought to tell your story. And I said, no, I, I don't think so, Nathan. And uh, finally, he said, you know, there, there are a, a lot of misconceptions about coaches, and people think you've got to do it a certain way. Uh, you've got a platform now, a very small window. You've won a Super Bowl. Maybe now you can... Uh, write something that will tell people there, there's a different way to do it. And with that, he kind of got me. I said, well, that makes sense. If we can talk about how to, to coach and lead and help people be better, uh, maybe there's some merit to it. So we put the book together and it, it did very well. You know, Tony and Lauren Dungy have a number of kids, but there might be one we'll have to keep an eye on. When you were up for the Hall of Fame induction again, your son, Justin, who would have been 10 years of age then, clearly he has a career as a prophet in front of them. <laughs> well, he was telling me he was so sure last year was going to be my year. We had missed it, gotten to the final 15, two years in a row. And he says, Dad, I'm telling you, this is your year. I said, Justin, you never know. It's difficult. And there's 15 strong candidates. He went to his teacher, had the teacher write a note to us. I'm giving Justin all of his assignments so he can go to the Super Bowl with you, and he just feels strongly that he needs to be there. He was so sure. Well, when we were in the hotel room and got the call, knock on the door, actually, that uh, I had been inducted or elected, he just started crying, Dad, I'm so proud of you. And I said, how could you cry? You knew it. You <laughs> predicted it. But uh, it was a special moment to have him uh, there with us. When did you know that it was time to retire? 2008 season, actually. We had had a, another great year. We got knocked out of the playoffs, and we had been uh, coaching. This was my uh, 13th year as a head coach, and I think both of us just felt there were some other things that we could do. The Lord was calling us to. Uh, we had some ministries in Tampa we wanted to get involved with, and after praying about it and taking four or five days a after the season was over, we both came to the conclusion that uh, this is the right time. While the Super Bowl was the ultimate in the game of football, I've seen you just as excited talking to prisoners who've come back later to let you know about the impact in our life or one that you helped to steer on the right path. Yeah, I um, had the opportunity when I got to Tampa to do some visitations uh, in the prisons, federal prisons in Florida. And it was really, really special. I uh, got a chance to go see Michael Vick when he was in Leavenworth Prison and kind of help him get going and get back into the, the National Football League. Tony, you've been an encouragement to so many other people, a true American hero, clearly a Hall of Famer. Thank mm -hmm. you so much for being with us. Thanks for having me, JB. Tony Dungy. We'll see you next week on another edition of The James Brown Show.